Nigel. All right, Nigel, we just need to focus. Cool? I'm focused. Are you focused? I am focused. Oh, it's dark. Hi. I'm just Where are the out. lights in here? I just don't. Hi. Okay, so we have to do a show. A show? We're doing a show right now. A show right now. Not a I thought you booked the space. No, I did book the space. There's people. <laughs> oh, hi, y'all. Do we have lights? Yeah, where's the light? Uh-huh. Yeah, cool. We, right, we got this. Go. We're professionals. Great. All right, so she said host. Oh, these chairs host. are nice. Oh, there's okay. water. Hi. All right. I'm going to get some of this. You ready? Yeah, sure. Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm Kimberly Gomez. Hi, and I'm Nigel Samaj. And welcome to the 2019 New Centennial event. Centennial. That's what this is. What's the centennial? It's 100 years, right? 100, 100 years. Oh, yeah. got you. Boom. 100 years, 100 years ago? <laughs> So, okay. Professionals. Uh, well, uh, <laughs> ladies, gentlemen, non-binary and non-gender conforming folks, welcome to our show this evening. Welcome, Morning. welcome. Yes, yes, yes. Welcome, welcome. Ooh. Ooh, these are some nice chairs we got here. Yes, we stand Ooh. a good chair. We should, uh, we should fill them up with guests. More people? Yeah. Cool. Hey, who, who should we bring up first? Uh, I'm going to look out. Let's see. Who should oh, we bring? It's... Hey, Claire. Hey, girl, what's up? You want to join us? Uh, code uh, Senate Chair of the Student Senate. Come on out. Come on uh, Claire up. Claire Stevens. <laughs> what's up, boo? Welcome. And Claire, we have a, a quick question for you. Just Why me. did you decide on the new school? Um, well, I think I decided on the new school because of the value of social justice, mostly. Um, and I think that it just seemed like a really good place for a student to be. Great, and then what led your interest into being part of the Student Senate? I think that my interest in the Student Senate did branch from the fact that I felt that the air of social justice that was um, produced when looking at the new school wasn't exactly internal as much as external, and I felt that maybe I could change that. Amazing, and do you want to bring a friend up here with you? I would, I would actually like to bring my co-chair Gustavo up here. Hello, Gustavo. Hello. Hello. Uh, Hi. Gustavo. That's Gus, right. Gus. Uh, Gus. Gus is fine. Yeah. Gus. Beautiful. Look at that. Uh, so it says here that you hold a BA in Human Behavior and Society and an MFA in Theater. Uh, could you talk to us a little bit about your connection between art and activism? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I actually chose the uh, arts management program here at the new school. It's a new graduate program uh, because it um, invites you to uh, unite social justice and art and, uh, uh, and look at arts management from a different perspective. And then, oh, can, uh, hey Claire, can you hand me this book over here for a second? Love that. There's this um, book for those of you who've never seen a book. This is what <laughs> one looks like. Um, it is titled A Drama in Time, The New School Century. Uh, and we're going to bring out some guests to talk about the first hundred years of the new school. So please welcome Dean of the New School for Research, for Social Research, William Milberg. Executive Dean of the, of the Schools of Public Engagement, Mary Watson. And the University Provost, Tim Marshall. This is quite heavy to me. Thank you. It is very heavy. Yeah. We don't lift books at the drama school. <laughs> That's what I've heard. Instead, we lift our emotions. Um, so and each other. <laughs> exactly. Uh, Tim, can you tell us a little bit about this book and if it's going to be available at any local bookstores? I can. Thank you. So this book is uh, a product of John Reed actually wrote it, but it's with a tremendous amount of input from a whole range of people across the university. And it's the first time that we have ever told the whole story of the new school when all the parts were separate and when they, how they came together, why they came together, and who we are now that we're all together. So from Parsons from 1895 and, and, uh, and Manus from 1916, thank you, Richard, um, <laughs> and so on. They're separate stories and, and then when they came together. So we're very proud of it. It's the first time we've ever had it, that whole story in one place, in one voice, and it is available 
in independent bookstores and Barnes and Noble and our own bookstore around the corner. So, and it's a, this is the time capsule for the last 100 years uh, of the university. So we're very proud of it. Thank you. That's amazing. And Will, could you give us uh, just a, your thoughts on the importance of the university in exile and Ecole Libre? I don't know if I said that properly. <laughs> yes. The, so everybody wants me to talk about the university in exile. And, and, and there's a good reason for that, because the New School for Social Research is the current name of what was in 1933 called the University in Exile, which was a, a, a creature of a very courageous academic act by the president of the New School at the time, Alvin Johnson, to bring over a whole group of particularly German scholars who had been thrown out of their jobs by the Nazi regime in 32. I, you know, I want to step back. P people ask me to talk about the history, and I think it's mainly because I have worked here for most of the last hundred years. <laughs> <laughs> so I have first-hand knowledge of that history. Uh, and what I wanted to say was that uh, while you asked me about 1933 and the University in Exile, and we can, we can talk about it, and I, I, I'm fascinated by it, we're here to celebrate 100 years. And in some ways, 1919, 1933 was really important as a geopolitical gesture at the uh, uh, beginnings of Nazism and fascism in Europe and a kind of saving of an academic tradition. So it had a geopolitical significance. But 1919, in some ways, was more important. It was a political moment when we come out of these very dark times of World War I, and there's a group of scholars at Columbia who say, there are problems with the oath of loyalty, there are problems with the hierarchy of academia, and there are problems in the way we teach and learn. And let's do something new. And they came down, downtown, I think in a more courageous act than 1933, and they started a new school. Thank you so much. Thank you. And Mary. How did the history of the new school, how does it relate to your work and to you personally? So just uh, following Will and talking about 1919, sometimes when I introduce uh, the new school to some of our uh, guests and audiences that are visiting, I talk about what 1919 was like. And what they remind us is that the challenges that we're facing in the geopolitical world in 1919 are really not so different today. And so the new school really 100 years later is even uh, more relevant than it was in 1919 in that moment of courageous departure for Columbia. Um, the idea of teaching and learning at the New School in 1919 was really about opening up the doors to communities that had not traditionally been part of higher education. And so um, the, um, the large open seminars, the very low priced or free uh, uh, courses, the no degrees and the non-credit environment was really about learning for all. And over the course of the New School's history, we've moved more into conventional degree offerings and things like that. Um, in the 1940s, Clara Meyer, who was one of the original founding um, forces of the establishment of the university, designed and established the first bachelor's program for adult students, the first adult program. Um, and that program continues on to this day. So when I think about the work that I'm doing now, it really does harken back to those values that who are the learners? Everyone's a learner, that we should be open and accessible to everyone in our communities, uh, both locally and around the world, and that we should find ways to reach out to the current racial, demographic, uh, gender identities, and other kinds of dimensions of our time, because to be relevant moving forward, we really need, need to embrace the learners of now. Thank you so much, Mary. Yeah, thank you. And then just a general question for those, um, for everyone right now sitting here. Um, would you say that at the new school we respond to history or that we make it? Mm. We're making it all the time, that's for sure. But we're also responding to it. So I think when you declare that yourself a new school, which is always a curious name to give yourself at the very beginning, uh, because you might turn 100, so what do you... <laughs> <laughs> so what's up with that? But it's constantly calling us to actually make history, which is what I really like about the name. It's like constantly reminding us that that's what we're about. But that's the spirit of the legacy and the history that we bring forward. So it's never one or the other. And, and following back to the introduction of the two students here, um, thank you for saying why you came to the university. I mean, the new school is not a place to me or an institution. It's an idea. 
And we are remaking ourselves constantly because the people in this room and the students in our classrooms and the faculty and staff um, are really trying to find ways to have a collective vision of what the future needs and what the future calls for. So it has a sort of um, built-in remaking because every person who joins the new school brings their own idea of what they think the world should look like. And so in that way, I think it's different than other institutions because we're constantly remaking it every day. I, <clears throat> on that note, I feel like we also respond to history a lot because of how our students are and how um, engaged they are with like the political climate of today. So I feel like we also respond to all of the um, yeah. like student activism that happens here and that is responding to history being made. Absolutely. Yeah, I feel like I jumped, I jumped a lot from like college to college until I finally graduated. And I have never, <laughs> and I've never uh, been around so many people that care about social justice and care about politics and care about making a difference in the real world. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I would just add that uh, I agree with everything everybody said, but just uh, not to sugarcoat it. This idea of having a legacy and yet always trying to reinvent it in light of contemporary struggles and conflicts is, is very challenging. And, and you know, when we went through the student unionization drive a few years ago, that was a very challenging exercise and we got through it, but it's one of many that we've experienced. And in some ways our history could be told as a history of conflict, mm -hmm. not just kind of living up to a, uh, you know, some idealized spirit. Right. That's true. Thank you so much. Uh, ooh, thank you guys, That's, uh, <laughs> that sounded like, that's, as a drama uh, person down at Bank Street, that's really interesting to hear the, uh, the answer to those questions because I think as theater makers, those are the questions that we are constantly being asked mm -hmm. is, um, are we making history or making new things or are we responding to it? And I think the best art does both. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the best places do both and I um, am glad to be a part of an institution that I believe is doing both. So uh, thank you for that. And just to add on to that, um, as a new student, I'm a first year MFA student here, and everything that you guys have just expressed is something that we feel very strongly over at Bank Street, and the fact that it's something that is college-wide just makes, reassures me that I've made the right decision coming here. So thank you. You're welcome. Uh, can we now please welcome the Dean of the Eugene Lang College of Liberal Arts, Stephanie Browner. And... <laughs> and the Executive Dean of the College of Performing Arts, Richard Kessler. Thank you for joining us on stage. So, we've been talking <laughs> nice about job. history. How do we stay relevant? Um, am I mic'd? Can you hear me? Okay. Um, we've already answered that in part, I think, and what some of my colleagues have said, I think really goes to the heart of the challenge and to meet the moment, to meet the challenges in higher ed, to meet the challenges that are global in terms of climate, that are national in terms of an incredibly divided nation and uncertainty, uncertainty about what is the nation state. Uh, and I do think that there's a core premise there, which is to be a critical thinker, to always look out, to read, to think, to create. Um, to hear thoughts other than your own, to dare to listen to a challenge to your own perception and to embrace that. Um, and I think it's true that both the new school values this, but we're also challenged to keep doing it. And for me, at the end of the day, that comes through in being in dialogue with students and the world all the time. Thank you. Because of the way things work in the university and in many businesses, institutions, it's very easy to go into a state of stasis. I think it's, in some ways, the pull of gravity leads you to that. A teacher teaches a great course. A curriculum is put in place that you've worked very hard on and you want to give it time. And those things, how they're balanced with renewal, with the new, ensuring that you're constantly weaving what you're doing today, what you've done in the past, and what you're going to do in the future, and a commitment to that renewal that then ties to what Stephanie brought up, the listening, the critical thinking, the putting your thinking caps on, watching the world around you, listening and talking to the students. 
taking a look at the things that are going on. And then what I would say finally is, I think it's an interesting question, the sort of the critical thinking as a leader or administrator. You ask yourself, what do we do well? What could we do better? And perhaps what are others doing that we're not, that we might learn from? And if you tie that all together, I think that that creates a type of dynamism that really helps to um, assure, to some degree, relevance. Thank you so much, Richard. You know, I, I, just to add one more thought, we've talked a lot about institution, history, sort of these big concepts. At the end of the day, learning is a very human activity. Humans love to learn. We're like learning machines. It makes us happy. If you're depressed, go learn something. Uh, it lifts our spirit. And ideally, done well, collectively, it lifts us all up. Um, and I think at the end of the day, that's who we should be and what we have to always return to. Thank you. All right, so now we've reached uh, a segment in which we're gonna do a little lightning round questions here. So uh, you're gonna have a split second. If I'm nice, I'll maybe give you two to answer these questions. All right, you guys good? You ready? We're good. Yes, okay. Yes, we can. First impulse, best impulse. Here we go. Who from the new school history do you wish you could have dinner with? We'll start this way. Clara Meyer. Dorothy Strait. Gilda Lerner. Jonah Hill. <laughs> <laughs> Martin Luther King Jr. Alvin Johnson. W.E.B. Du Bois. Okay, we're going to swing it back this way. <laughs> Did any university in exile faculty arrive here by blimp? <laughs> I have no idea. No idea. <laughs> I'm pass. <laughs> Listen, they got out as fast as they could. So I don't know exactly how they got here, but mainly boat. Nothing to add. We just passed. Just passed it all together. What new school event do you wish you had attended? This way. I would have loved to have been there for the 50th anniversary. I would have liked to have been there for the first board meeting. <laughs> I still don't get why Winston Churchill was on it, so I'm fascinated. Um, I would love to be here for the address in 1964 by MLK and Tishman. I'm going to say the force board meeting as well. And take my seat up on that table. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. I'm actually going to steal his answer a little bit and say I would love to have been here on the 50th and seen what people had planned for the next 50 years and what we accomplished and what we could mm. have accomplished. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Uh, 1959, when Clara Meyer had a national conference on the future of education, wondering what they had then and compared to what we have now. For me, it's the, it's the general seminars in the 1930s, which brought all these German scholars and then some American scholars together across disciplines to really hash out what was the future of the world given that it had turned fascist. For me, it would be the conversation around Sekou Sendiata when he did some sort of graffiti acts around art and art being inclusive or not. And I think it really created turmoil on campus, and I would love to have been part of that conversation. Uh, the slowest elevator at the new school. <laughs> <laughs> the one you're waiting for. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> I feel very passionately that it's the 16th Street elevator. <laughs> that's, that's fact. <laughs> I was going to say the one in Bank Street, because we only yes. have one, and it mm -hmm. just takes yeah, forever. Small. Now, granted, there are only three floors at Bank Street, <laughs> only two of which yeah, we exactly. have classes on. But <laughs> <laughs> just left dance class, and you don't want to walk up those stairs, you take the elevator. All right. Does the new school respond? Say that again. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Ignore me. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I would definitely say it might be a tie between 16th Street elevators. And if anybody takes the one in the Welcome Center, that one like jerks, and it's just the <laughs> slowest. It's terrifying. Take the stairs. Take the stairs. <laughs> Avoid a problem. 
Um, we, by the way, we have a team of researchers trying to understand the al <laughs> <laughs> algorithm that is used to run the elevators on 16th That's Street. Really it's a really <laughs> remarkably complex system. And will they undertake algorithmic accountability Absolutely. as well? <laughs> Absolutely. There you go. Stay, it's being taken care of. Thank kind you. Of, yeah. Thank you. Um, I guess we sort of answered this, but if anyone else had an answer, um, does the new school respond to history or make it? If anyone had any additional answers. I think what I think is impressive about our students is that when they're responding to history, they try to be aware of it as much as possible. And not just what's um, explicit that they know, but actually what's implicit and what they're carrying in their bodies and in their, in their uh, deep memories so that they don't recreate the same kinds of things that are really plaguing society today. I, I was, the fir my first year here was the Occupy time and the new school building was occupied mm -hmm. and they were making history. Uh, they were, there were teach-ins, there was a real grappling with questions and how do you seize a moment like Occupy, how do you occupy your own institution, and so we, we make it. I think we make it too. I think if we look backwards to John Cage and what he was doing here 1950 through 1960, he was making history, he was not responding to it, he was absolutely making it. Mm. Thank, you. All right, thank you. And the final question, uh, who do you wish was on stage with us right now? I think Gus and I would both agree that we would love to have our advisors, um, Megan and Travis, who are both here, as well as uh, Kevin Williams, Dean of Students, who I'm not sure is here, but would love to be up here with us. I'd like to have Thelma Armstrong, who's been a long-term staff member here, yes. just retiring uh, after 36 years, who's been an institution and a, and a stalwart on the social justice agenda of this university. I really admire her. Hmm. I think I'd echo that. Plus there's three NPCs. Mm -hmm. I would love to bring up the Executive Dean of Parsons School of Design, Rachel Schreiber. as well as the Dean and Senior Vice President of Open Campus, Helen Wuzzo. And the President of the New School, David Van Zandt. all of these chairs filled Welcome. with these wonderful <laughs> folks you. here. Uh, I have a question for you, David. Sure. Uh, who at the new school today inspires you? You know, uh, that, that's a, a tough question. There are so many inspiring people in all parts of the new school, uh, ranging from the people who protect us. At, oh, start. Yeah, this mic's not hot. Yeah, turn it off. to the technician on yeah. stage. <laughs> yes. Great job. You tap. He's a handheld. Okay. Okay. Well, uh, what was the question again? <laughs> <laughs> Take two. No, Please forget everything that just happened. Who at the new school today inspires you? Oh, yes. Well, uh, look, there's so many fabulous people around in this community that make up this community, and everybody contributes something to it, whether it's the, the security personnel who are at the doors who uh, greet everyone every day coming, as well as, as protectors, to the facilities people who who keep the place clean as best as they can, because this goes 24 hours, uh, this place goes 24 hours a day. Obviously, we have a whole range of staff members, many of whom you know, have put this entire week on, and I have to thank them for doing this. <laughs> and I should particularly point out um, Ashley Campbell, or someone who knows Ashley Bruni, who has been our leader for this. Uh, And then, of course, there's the faculty, um, the faculty at all the different schools who are, who are really what make this place run in terms of why students come here, what students, what students learn here, uh, and they are, they're tremendous. I think, though, probably at the end of the day, it's the students for me. 
Um, it's the students because at this level of education, you learn from each other often a lot more than even from, you know, even from our wonderful, even from our wonderful faculty. And it's a group that, uh, you know, we don't always know. We always sometimes live in our own bubbles, but they are, uh, they have so many divergent interests uh, ranging from people uh, over to drama school, you know, the furthest place away on the campus right now, uh, to all the, the creative people in Parsons or uh, over at other parts of Copa, whether it's Manus or the Jazz School. Um, you know, it's our students at Lang. Uh, it's our graduate students over at the New School for Social Research. Uh, and then it's the whole range of students that Tellen um, serves, which are, are students who are non-traditional students, whether they're adults or K through 12, who are all part of our um, all part of our community here. So I think at the end of the day, it's about, you know, I've always felt it's about the students, and that's what we're ultimately here for. That's changed over our history in terms of different types of students, but um, to this day, and I think for the next 100 years, if we focus on that, that's, that's what will be important. What's best for our students? Thank you. Um, thanks so much. Um, so I think we're Rachel and Helen, if you had to spend 24 hours alone somewhere on campus, where would it be? <laughs> Together? <laughs> it's an open-ended question. You tell me. Confirm. Qualify. I think my office. <laughs> because then I could uh, think about what's next in higher education and where, where we need to serve students and how we could serve students from all backgrounds all locations, at all times, at all places. And I think that that's probably the quietest place I can think <laughs> of over 24 hours on campus. So that's, that's where I'd spend it. Thank you. I think I would choose the, um, I really like to sit at the countertops in the second floor cafeteria facing Fifth Avenue. And I just, I love, I love the space in, that in this building for the way that it, I feel that it creates transparency between the new school and the city. And it's a, it's a place where I really feel that connection. You're inside, you're on campus. There's a lot going on behind you if you're sitting there facing the street, and yet you're seeing the city unfold you know, outside. So I, I just love that, I love that spot. So we're gonna do some little additional questions that just general so anyone can answer these. Uh, where do you like to take people or what do you like to show guests at the new school? I've been dying to talk about this one. Yeah. It's the glass <laughs> box because I think this happened in just the last few years and I think it's a, an amazing thing that happened on this campus and kudos to College of Performing Arts for bringing John Zorn from his funky little jazz club over on whatever, <laughs> First Avenue or something. I used to truck my way over there on a Saturday night and stand out in line to get into that tiny little place and sit on the floor and hear amazing music. Um, often see new school students playing there, Lang students playing there. And then that this suddenly came over here and is right there, the glass box where we can all see it. To make that part of us and us part of that I just say thank you. I mean, I think that's part about who we become in the future, and I think it's a spectacular place. <laughs> <laughs> I have one. I absolutely always have to bring anyone by the Making Center at Parsons. I'm such an amazing space, and a space that um, also brings us all together. And I would, I, I'd strive to schedule a tour for when. Um, it's at its busiest because walking through there when the students are in there and, and making things and there's faculty about and staff helping them is really to me just the, the, the quintessence of the Parsons experience. I, I like, go ahead, Tim. I like to bring people down that stairwell that you can see there because on the ceiling of the stairwell as you go down yeah. is a whole mashup of the whole history of all the classes, not all of them, but all classes of the new school from its founding to now. And it's only then when you really just, because they're all mixed up together. And that's when you really get a sense of what the new school is, because it's such an unusual institution. And we sort of forget that, but when you walk down that stairwell and look up at all the courses yeah. and the people that taught them, then you start to realize just how distinct and unique this place is. So that's where I go. I, I was, uh, I wanted to say two, two places. Okay. Uh, one, one is the Orozco Room, which absolutely is, is essential part of the tour. It represents 
our history at its best and at its worst. It's stunning, <laughs> and it's kind of a solemn space where uh, you're forced to think both about the new school and about the history of the Western world. Um, in a lighter, on a lighter note, you know, we're up on 16th Street, slow elevators, <laughs> and I bring everybody to this building. And I, I have to say, for somebody who's been here 28 years, I grew up in 65 Fifth Avenue when it had rotten couches and broken escalators and tiny uh, foggy windows. And to bring people here, and we brought a conference of 1,200 people here this summer, for example, this is the new school, they say. And it's just such a delight to have a center, a hub, a space with such sparkle and such functionality to show the world. It's changed this university from my perspective. Following on my that favorite point. place oh, I'm sorry. is um, the auditorium on 12th Street. I think it's our Carnegie Hall. Mm -hmm. The auditorium on 12th Street is where, when you stand on the stage, when you sit in the seats, that's, that's where Martin Luther King made his speech. Mm -hmm. That's where Marlon Brando, Tony Curtis, and Tennessee Williams took classes, acting classes, on that stage. This is the past, that glorious past. Who knows who spoke on our rent making speeches, conferences, convocations. It's our Carnegie Hall. And it's not just the past, as we know by everything happening this week, everything happening going forward, that that space lives every single day with the most incredible presentations, including classes, including performance, including lectures and conferences. So yeah, I, I particularly love that space. Following on to that, I um, would say that I'm really privileged to work with the Vera List Center for Art and Social Justice, and the Vera List Center you know, gives amazing tours of the art collection. So more broadly, if you look at the commissioned pieces of art that the New School has done over its history, including the Orozco murals, you see a real trajectory of the social issues that inflect our current time, and um, it's really amazing, including the, the artwork that's installed in this very building here that we, we're sitting in, and new pieces that are being commissioned to come forward. So take a visit of the art collection. And there's also a new book on all the site-specific work of the new school you should check out. It's a beautiful an event this week. Yeah. Book launch Wednesday evening. Yeah, book launch Wednesday. <laughs> and I like to compare elevator art. I always take my friends to the Waschenberg outside of an elevator. Hmm. Yeah, that says a lot about the new school. One, one area that I, I like that people haven't, I, all, the, all the places you've mentioned, <clears throat> I think are tremendous. I like to take uh, people to them, but... Um, it's actually the building down on 13th Street, the, the um, 5 East 13th Street that we often forget about, but is really a core of part of what Parsons does. And, mm. and it's got, you talk about a slow elevator. <laughs> <laughs> slow getting in the front door. It's so oh, narrow okay. there, and the students have to wait. And our, our poor security person there has to um, squeeze on a little tiny chair right in there. It's terrible. Um, uh, but uh, once you get upstairs, and you walk around the different floors, whether it's the top floor with fine arts, architecture, it's, um, you know, we have um, uh, interior design, all sorts of different activities going on there. Just walking around is energizing. It's, mm. it's, it's one sense, it's, it's like the making center, but there's so many more things going on on, on on all those floors in that building. It's an ugly building from the outside, I agree, but um, it's, a, it's a hive, it's a beehive of sort mm. of activity. I would say, um, I'm biased, but the theater at 151 Bank Street um, is probably my favorite place to be, even when there's not a show, and my favorite place to take people, because uh, whether or not the performances are what people would say, quote unquote, good, um, <laughs> they put their heart and soul out on stage, and um, I love watching um, the performances that happen there, because the work that we do down at Bank Street is um, mind-blowing. And I think that the work that the actors and across all the classes put on that stage um, is, is better than anything you'll pay $500 to go see on Broadway. So come down to 151 Bank Street <laughs> and you can actually see Oliver Twist this week Absolutely. Uh, happening at Bank Street. So come see the class of 2020, the graduating wow. MFA class of 2020 and Oliver Twist. Yeah. All right. That is great. Uh, for me, it has to be this building, um, especially the fact that it has so many windows. I yeah. love being outdoors, or oh, let me rephrase that. I don't like being outdoors, I like looking outside. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and at Bank Street, we don't have that many windows, 
but just walking around here and getting that natural sunlight, even though you're going through massive amounts of work, it's just so having your foot outside and inside at the same time. And on that note, what is the best margarita spot in the five block radius? Go. El Cantonero. Yes, who said that? What did yes. you say? We had this conversation about safety. Yes, yes. Rosa Anyone Mexicano else? is what Richard Kessler told me to say. Look content to West. Content <laughs> to West, yeah. That's it? There's only two spots around here? Don't, don't drink margaritas. They just give me a headache. I, <laughs> <laughs> Who cares? At the ripe old age of 20, I don't drink. Uh, so. <laughs> uh, <laughs> moving on to the next question. <laughs> uh, you could also go to Wooden Ales down on 14th Street. They have great margaritas, and they fill them to the brim. <laughs> wooden nails? If you're yes, 21. Wooden nails. Not wooden nails. I thought wood it was wooden nails, wood nails, but it's not. It's wood and, and nails. It's a oh, wood great and nails. <laughs> wood and nails. Play on words. <laughs> Got it. Yeah. Uh, are there any current courses at the new school that you would like to take if you had the time? I would love to take the um, course on drag here. It's a course on drag? Yeah. What? My gosh. It's like the history of drag. Yeah. It started last year. <laughs> I've always Oh, my it. Marsha P. Johnson. How <laughs> dare they? How dare they tell me this? <laughs> um, there's a course here about um, artists as activists um, at COPA that I would really like to take. It doesn't work with my schedule, but maybe, maybe one day. <laughs> yeah. I'd say um, Race in the Media by Michelle Mater, who runs Creatively Speaking and uh, has really done a lot of work on featuring African-American women filmmakers. Mine is uh, Legacy of Women at New School with Gina Walker and, and Ellen Freeberg teaching, which is, uh, you know, we have a lot of mythologies about our history, and a lot of them are very male, and they leave a lot of the women stories out of them, and there's been a lot of very important women faculty, administrators, students, graduates, and that's what this course is about. Saturday afternoon, Women's Legacy at the New School. For yeah, there's people an event. organize right, an yeah. event Saturday afternoon. Um, it's the ULEC that's going on right now, Aaron Jakes. Um, I'm not sure what the title of it is, but I know on Thursday night, Iram Kendi, whose latest book is How to Be an Anti-Racist, will be speaking as part of his class. Does anyone know the title of his class? It's a, what is it? Global 1919. Thank you, Global 1919, anyways, I would, sit in on his class in a heartbeat. Yeah, I, th I think I shouldn't probably pick any particular course, but I do think, uh, I do think what, what I would really like to do is get into one of the older, the, the general seminars. I think I really would, would have loved them when they're going on um, in that kind of debate, and I know it's going on in other places around the university. Now, in different schools, in different places, but in one sense, that's our, um, our long-term academic heart, that kind, of, that kind of discussion. I'd like to take the senior chorus in Manus Prep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to take, I wish I would have taken, uh, Dean Watson and Professor Sakiko uh, Bakuda Parr's class on uh, global fashion and human rights. Mm. Thank you. You're welcome. Springtime. Yeah. <laughs> Got it coming online, too. <laughs> I'd like to take a course in vocal production at COPA. <laughs> I love them all equally. But, uh. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Oh, thank you. So I just want to take a moment to acknowledge that all of the colleges of the new school are represented on stage right now. Yeah. Yay. Yay. And we were talking about this book being some sort of time capsule earlier. And I'm wondering, what would you put in a time capsule for someone to discover about the new school 100 years from now? Well, while we ponder on that. Oh, my, them, am I supposed to go first on it? No. Uh, we, no. Here we go. Oh, here we go. Okay, well, I will go first because they have it up there. <laughs> for those of you who uh, visit my office, there's a sign up on the wall. There's actually a small sign on the table in my office, too, that says, that's the sign uh, up there. And I think that um, by putting that in a time capsule, I would love to come back in 100 years, open up that time capsule, 
and see if the school, university has remained true, uh, true to that, true to that statement. So. Yeah. It's my turn now. Okay. Yes. Cool. Yeah. Um, so Student Senate pondered this for a little bit, um, and Gus and I decided on the climate assessment that was just released this summer, um, because this is a huge step in the right direction for getting student voices and actually having tangible evidence on how to improve the school and the university as a whole. And I think that would be amazing to open up in a time capsule in 100 years and um, be able to see if we improved on this, if we actually use the information that we got and made this a better university for the students. Thank you. Stephanie? No, Helen. Oh, Helen, sorry. That's OK. So this is uh, what we use now for online learning. I'd like to put all these images in a time capsule. Um, I'd like you to focus on that cell phone over there. That cell phone has more algorithms in it than all the computers that sent, or purportedly sent, depending on your point of view, men to the moon. And so uh, right now, uh, right now, uh, what we think of as cutting edge technology will probably be as uh, old looking as one of those radios with tubes. You're probably all too young to remember those, but the little wire coils with the uh, tubes and they used to buzz and go wee. And so I think that this will look very, very old in 100 years' time. And I do hope that what the promise was for technology uh, when it came through for education, it was supposed to democratize learning. I'm not sure that has entirely happened. And I hope that whatever happens in the next 100 years proves to be uh, something that allows people more access to education. So. Mm -hmm. So mine's going to be a video, and it's a montage of the six different times that Bell Hooks came to campus. And she spoke on just about every stage, every room we've mentioned, with Laverne Cox, Cornell West, Gloria Steinem. And her whole premise is, it, is through dialogue. She never wanted to give a talk. She didn't. She wanted to be in dialogue with all kinds of people. People lined up to be in dialogue with her. It was easy to get people to join her on the stage. Uh, lines down Fifth Avenue for some of the events, and just incredibly energized conversation for those years in which she was coming. She often spent a week here, sometimes having small meetings with students. And so a few years ago, we made a montage, a video clip. And I think this says a lot about what I hope is one of our enduring values, which is critical thinking and pleasure while you do it. Mm -hmm. A lot of these we laughed the whole time. <clears throat> We are excited to be here at the new school today. In the week leading up to the residency, it seemed that at any given moment, just walking down the street, you could very likely overhear conversations and reflections among students, faculty, and staff on Bell Hooks and her work. Okay, Cornell. No, we do want to tell the truth. See, we want you to. <laughs> we do want to tell the truth. We want you to throw down around the issues of blackmail, misogyny sexism, have we progressed? We have to resist again and again people trying to deny us that space of emotional well-being. Our bodies cannot speak freely as long as they are under surveillance. What am I looking like when I am free? Critical thinking is not about how much education you have. For us as decolonizing people, we have to develop a more mature critical gaze. How do we resist and reframe imperialist, white supremacist, capitalist yes. patriarchy? <laughs> Don't you want a t-shirt that says that? I so want a t-shirt that says imperialist. But the print will be so small, we, we, we won't be able to read it. <laughs> Because of Bell Hooks' writing, I found ways of belonging as a queer, gender nonconforming Native American. I found tools to address my own rage associated with generations of genocide. None of us come to black feminism except through you. My whole week here at the new school is not just about affirming the 20 years of teaching to transgress, but of me meeting so many people who are sharing with me how my work impacted on their lives. That's why your work was so crucial to me when I was a college student, that it was, the, it was my point of view um, that changed. You have to be willing to come to these new spaces of consciousness um, first, and then once we are there, to stay there. We've explored 
radical thinking, radical thought, decolonizing the imagination. But I think most of all, we've had radical honesty, radical openness, and from Bell Hooks, radical generosity. It's there in that place of joy that we have a certain kind of strength. And to me, joy is connected to feminist thinking and practice that affirms for me every day <laughs> that I have that right to be exactly who I am, where I am, creating that work that is such a source of strength and power to me and hopefully to others. Yes, so I think I have a, a visual. So I'd like to contribute to the time capsule what's called the timeline of the 400 years of inequality. So over the last two years and continuing uh, into next year, um, Milano professor Mindy Fullalove and her organizing team, who I'll mention in just a moment, um, have been working in student classrooms and in national organizings around the country to unpack the history of inequality um, over the past 400 years, which refers back uh, to the landing of the first enslaved people in Jamestown. So students have been having organizing events on campus. They've been studying classrooms about un trying to unpack these kinds of inequalities especially around uh, racial identity, gender identities, and how they're changing, um, and also around workers and workers' rights, um, with the goal in next year to actually looking forward to um, building new systems that are to address some of these inequalities. Uh, next slide. So I just, I'll, I'll call your attention to this, and you can have a look at it on the website, but I will say that the 400 Years of Inequality Project is not just a project of those students in the classroom. So in the very best new school tradition, this is a national organizing movement. So this project has lifted up and, and profiled um, and uh, done a call for observances across the nation, where more than 100 events have been held nationwide. Um, it's a teaching and learning space. It's a research space. One of the student organizers, um, Ashley Bernal, is doing her dissertation on the organizing process. And it's an imagination of how do we unpack the kinds of inequalities that are endemic in our system and how do we um, address them moving forward. And the course that Helen mentioned that I taught in the spring about uh, global fashion and uh, human rights, it was so empowering and so amazing to look at young design students, fashion design students, who are committed to ending the injustices in the global fashion production industry. And so we see this not just in the 400 Years Project, but students across the university are really building a better world. So um, take a look at the 400 Years website. Thank you. Richard? Another enduring value to steal or borrow Stephanie's term is the value of, ex of experiment. Mm. The fact that this university, the new school, has been welcoming to artists and teachers who may not have had any other place to teach and to work. So I chose a work by Steve Reich, who taught at the new school for three years between 1969 and 1972. It's the only institution that Steve Reich ever taught at. And I chose this work, Drumming, which is one of the most important works in the 20th century. It changed the shape of music. And he wrote it, of course, in the period of time that he was teaching at the New School, teaching electronic music composition, teaching improvisation. This, what you're seeing right now, is actually the cover of the original recording written in Steve Reich's hand and with diagrams of how the musician should be set up. It really is its own sound world that, um, that has influenced artists from that moment on and continues to influence artists. So it's not just this, but we're also going to hear a little under two minutes of the very end of Steve Reich's drumming.
Beautiful. Beautiful. Thank you. Will? Thank you. That was beautiful, Richard. Um, and, and I really love all, all the interventions. And, and mine is, is, is not very visually exciting. There's no <laughs> soundtrack. <laughs> but it's an attempt to get at the spirit and, and uh, who we've been and who we hope we might be in 100 years. And this is the medal to the living spirit. And it was, I believe, uh, the invention of Jonathan Fanton, former president of the New School. And with us? Uh, who's with us today? Jonathan, Jonathan is in the front row. I, I also want to introduce one other person who's sitting next to him, who is this year's recipient. We have revived the Medal to the Living Spirit in the last two years. And I'll say a word about it, but first I wanted to introduce this year's recipient, who's Ilsa Melamed. Please. The, the phrase, the living spirit, actually came from the great German uh, novelist and essayist Thomas Mann, who visited the New School around 80 years ago. And I'm just going to read a short quote of what he uh, said when he came to the New School. He was reflecting on the Nazis' removal of a placard that was hanging at the University of Heidelberg that read, To the Living Spirit. And what Thomas Mann said to the faculty is, quote, there is at the present time no home for the living spirit in German universities. I suggest that you faculty, talking to the new school, take these words and make them your motto to indicate that the living spirit has found a home in your country. And Clara Meyer was a recipient, Ira Katznelson, Ilsa Melamid. It embodies the kind of humanistic, intellectual, scholarly tradition of the new school, the need to understand society and social change while engaging with that society in a way that makes a difference. And our history is filled with moments of really bright moments where we've lived up to the living spirit uh, medal. I'm thinking of the 1980s work in Eastern Europe, which opened up a seminar on democracies with uh, really authoritarian communist regimes. I'm thinking of uh, last year's formation of a new university in exile consortium. And we have two PhD students this year who are brought in under a fellowship precisely because they were scholars at risk. So we have a pilot program which is not about faculty saving, but about students. We have uh, a Ukrainian student in our politics department and a Turkish student in the psychology department who's an asylum uh, uh, applicant. And the Ukrainian uh, studied with a professor in Ukraine who's, who had been fired from his job. So this student was unable to continue his studies. So we have, at various moments, revived the, the, the living spirit. And I think it is a project that harks back to what we talked about earlier, about honoring our, our, our legacy and our promise, but always trying to keep it fresh, revived in the present. And I just one other point, which is that I think it's something that really unites the schools at the New School. And I, I say this as Dean of New School for Social Research, but I feel that it is a kind of living spirit that I think you've seen today cuts across all the schools at the, at the university and really unites us. Thank you. Thank you, Will. Thank you. I like to put two objects in the time capsule that are uh, separated by about our 100 years um, and unfortunately are still both very relevant to today. Uh, the first is this photograph on the right of a shirtwaist. This shirtwaist is in our Parsons Fashion Study Collection. The shirtwaist, this shirtwaist was produced about 100 years ago. And the shirtwaist was a garment that democratized fashion for women on the one hand, uh, but on the other hand also is symbolic of the industrialization of, garment, of the garment trades. And the picture on the left is a photograph of the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory not far from here, just east of Washington Square Park, um, where very, actually what is still the, the single um, deadliest industrial tragedy in the history of the United States occurred in 1911, when 146 workers, uh, mostly women, perished because they were locked in the building, um, which was a common practice to prevent theft. 
Um, and so this, while, while there had been stirrings leading up to that, this event, um, this tragedy, this fire, really inaugurated the um, labor, labor rights movement, um, particularly for the garment trades here in New York City. Um, and my second object, if I can have the next slide, was this photograph also on the right of a flag produced here at Parsons in the Fashion Praxis Lab, um, which is led by a range of faculty, but including Timo Rissanen, um, Christina Moon, and Otto von Busch that addresses workers' rights, laborers' rights, again, in the, in the fashion industry. And this flag, which reads, a garment worker was killed yesterday, is hung um, at times outside of our building, the Parsons building, as you can see on the photograph on the left, when the Fashion Praxis Lab learns of such a death. So um, we have this continuing legacy. Um, we have, uh, of course, an amazing program that teaches students to be fashion designers and to be in the fashion industry. And I am really um, impressed and grateful for the ongoing attention that our faculty and students pay also to the need to uh, think about the labors who produce the garments that we wear and, and what that means. Thank you. Tim? So I think there's a video being queued up, but I'll introduce it. Uh, this is the first minute of a Peter Greenaway documentary about four composers. Virtually all of them, I think, have something to do with the new school, but this piece is uh, on John Cage, a documentary about John Cage you've already heard about. Uh, he famously said that he would only have worked at the new school and nowhere else because nowhere else would have actually employed him. Um, <laughs> and that actually embodies everything I love about the new school, as you'll hear in this, in this voiceover in a moment. Um, and as you've heard, I think, from across all these uh, great insights and, and, and uh, time capsule mementos, but the New School really is this kind of coming together of a highly critical perspective and a highly creative and radically creative one, sort of juxtaposed to one another, where we're brought together, I think, by and animated by an interest in the human condition and the human experience in, in various ways, uh, which is why politics and social justice become so important across all the schools, uh, as you just heard. So, there's that part of it. And also, um, when it queues up, you'll, it also, I think, shows the genius of the new school then and Clara Meyer and the improvisational quality that people would actually see a proposal like this coming from John Cage, which has nothing to do with music. It's about mushrooms. Um, and, and think, that's a great idea. And why is it a great idea? And then having a pedagogical rationale for it and going for it straight away. I don't know if it's queued. If it isn't queued, I'll keep talking because <laughs> Um, hopefully it'll come up in a moment. Um, it also is, I don't partic very often speak personally about things, but it has other layers of meaning for me as well because when I was 10 and 11 and 12, I actually took it upon myself to create an index of mushrooms uh, in my life. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this I'll summer I'm going to give a class in mushroom identification at the New School for Social Research. <laughs> when I proposed it to Dean Clara Meyer, she spoke to Professor McIver, who lives in Piermont. She said, what do you think about our having a mushroom class at the new school? He said, fine idea. Nothing more than mushroom identification develops the powers of observation. This remark was relayed both to the president and to me. It served to get the class into the catalog and to verbalize for me my present attitude toward music. It isn't useful, music isn't, unless it develops our powers of audition. But most musicians can't hear a single sound. They listen only to the relationship between two or more sounds. So, yeah. so uh, yes, so that's, and my father at the time wanted me to become a mycologist because I was the last child who was ever likely to go into science, which is his field. He abandoned that. I got, fell in love with exactly what the point of that course was, which is observation and photography. It's a photographic process. That I, and that's what took me to art school, which took me to work in a design school, which brought me to Parsons in the new school. So it has other, other layers as well. But, um, that's, but I, more than anything else, I just love the spirit of that. Thank you so much. So aside from um, everyone that's currently here on stage, we have some other people's thoughts and hopes for the next 100 years. Uh, Red Dog Films, which is a student production company here at the New School, um, has interviewed some people across campus. And this just in. Very recent, the New School 2019, talking about the New School 2119. Mm. <laughs>
As we look toward the next century, we wanted to hear from the community on their biggest hopes for the new school's next 100 years. I want us to really think how can we get creative about making education affordable. If you are not coming from an obscene amount of wealth, affording education or higher education is just a bit challenging. So I think there are more creative and ingenious ways that we can think about how people can afford school while also still providing all of the new updates and resources that the new school has been known to do. So I think uh, what the new school needs for the next hundred years is uh, a Hannah Arendt for the 21st century uh, and somebody who's able to bring that kind of perceptive uh, commentary to the digital age and human rights uh, and politics going forward. Over the last hundred years I feel like it's kind of become like a community for uh, outspoken like individuals to come together and not only share their ideas but collab on like even new ones so I'd like to see more of that. Um, I think that we still have a lot to work on and if we consider um, where we were and what we were doing when the new school first started I think we need to remember that and the importance of that and the students um, and the people who work here and the environment that we're in. Um, instead of just focusing so much on money, reputation, and things like that. Taking care of more of our recycling, I would love to see them continue and maybe improve upon the level of faculty and expertise that they have here, um, which is really fantastic. The new school, being a system in itself, can try to embody, embody more the change that we're learning as a student to become in this institution and to face also the challenges that um, they might be facing as an institution at a systemic level uh, with like faculty and organization and trying to, yeah, to be that change. So what I would like for the next hundred years of the new school uh, <laughs> would be to keep evolving, to keep uh, as art changes, as, as education changes, uh, to also keep changing. Uh, education is, um, is forever, we're always learning. The next hundred years for the new school, uh, I hope that there's a continuous you know, upward movement and change and um, rallying behind causes that are important to students and the students' voices continuing to be heard and shape our education and the direction of the institution itself. In the next 100 years, I hope this school is fully divested from fossil fuels. It is 100% renewable energy. Its sustainability plan has expanded to all its buildings, that we are zero waste, that we also support indigenous communities here in New York, and that the school can, I think, I hope we'll be celebrating Indigenous Peoples Day instead of Columbus Day. I hope that the new school will continue to stay up to date, um, stay modern. Um, I think that with Gen Z being the ruling generation now, that we have a fast-paced, moving mind that's kind of darting everywhere. And I hope that the new school will take that into consideration. I hope to see more collaboration that's happening between professors and other departments because a lot of the collaboration is always focused within the students. So you have students collaborating with other schools, other programs, other offices, other businesses, but it would also be great if faculty can embody that collaboration spirit that's in the vision and mission of the new school at Parsons. So for the, my future hopes for the new school would be to make it more accessible to um, students of color, um, immigrant students, indigenous students, um, just students that otherwise their paths would not have led them to be here. For the next 100 years, I hope to see more culturally diverse holiday. <laughs> I would like the new school to have more, I'll keep it the same, but more um, students to get involved with um, the health, like create a gym, create you know teams, eliminated all of that. So I would like to get that back. And I guess I hope in the next 
100 years that it that it doubles down on sort of the things that it stands for and I'd love to see more of it in action. So like understanding that the school is socially progressive, that in the next 100 years tuition would be free, housing would be free, <laughs> like education free, and also I mean just like more of an emphasis on like programs and um, I mean classes and faculty of different like races, ethnicities, different class. You know, that's something that I'd love to see more of conversation of in class in the new school. Um, so yeah, I guess that's something that I'd like to see more of. And I would like it now, not in a hundred years, but like, you know, <laughs> you, you, you take what you get. <laughs> My advice is to keep doing what you're doing. Uh, I really enjoy that the new school has like a very, um, I guess, very, very particular identity. And then maybe in a hundred years, we invent cryotechnology, then I can come back and take some of the new classes. <laughs> <laughs>well I think and in, in maybe we can um, talk among ourselves because it's something that uh, this entire group of people uh, here talk about pretty constantly about what you know how to plan for the next hundred years mm -hmm. of the university and I think uh, from all the speakers on the video you can they raise all the issues I mean they raise all the issues we're gonna face they raise all the challenges We'll need to, uh, need to deal with. I, there may be some they missed, but it, to me it was a pretty complete compendium of what we need to do. And I think the core thing is higher education is so important um, to everyone in our society um, and around the world, frankly. Um, and uh, you know, I think the new school has to play a leading role in that. And part of that is accessibility, you know, being, being affordable for people to get in. Uh, another part of it is how do we really respond to the changes going on in technology and culture um, with what has been a fairly old model um, for a long, long time. And I think we're going to have to figure we're going to have to um, um, figure that out. Um, I also think it's we have to maintain our worldwide reach. Um, we have students from all over the world now, faculty from all over the world. The trends, at least in this current decade, are unfortunately going, at least the current last couple of years, going the wrong way in, in that respect. Uh, but I only think the future of human, humanity is in all working together across a, a wide range of cultures. But um, uh, to me, that's sort of the, those are the big challenges. Uh, maybe Tim wants to say a few words about the Centennial Project uh, as part of our way of addressing that. Right, unexpected. Um, <laughs> the Centennial Project is something coming from, obviously, the Centennial, and it's basically to look at a long future, very much around the issues, that, as David said, that were raised in the video, like cost of education, access to education, uh, and those very serious questions that we're confronting, as well as the actual project of education, like what is it now? Uh, we do labor under some very old structures of degree types and things like that, that may not always serve students uh, in the best way possible. And so we continue to work at that. So it's an invitation to the whole community to get involved um, with the project. We're going to be launching it fairly soon. Uh, and because of, in, in our cycles, we tend to go year by year very quickly, like looking to the next year. And this is intended to have a longer look at our future and say, really, what kind of institution do we want to sort of be handing off to the next generation uh, coming in to steward the, the new school? So. You'll all be invited to participate, and I really hope you do. I just want to take a moment to do a shout out to Red Dog Productions, who created that video. Um, right. It's a student-run and organized um, in-house media production company run out of the School of Media Studies. And to tell all of you watching and, and here in the room that your power of storytelling is an incredibly powerful force in the world. And so I think as we look into the next 100 years, raising critical consciousness about issues, um, the writing, the media making, the various kinds of stories that you're telling, can really change the discourse. And we invite you to also change the discourse about what the future of higher education should look like or could look like, because you have an amazing capacity to be able to influence what's happening. While we're in shout out mode, um, I think I can see Mark Laramore. I think Julia might have left. Julia Polk's still here. I think my microphone just died. They have kept the history of the new school.
kind of going and the telling of it, the recording of it, the archiving of it for many years and run courses in it, lectures on it. And so much of what we've been bringing to the surface in this book and in videos and what have you is really thanks to their hard work over many years. And secondly, Pip and Parker really did help produce this thing, so thanks to Pippin. And on that note, thank you very much. We have, where is it coming Here's from? The cake. Here it is. Oh my God. We've got <laughs> a celebratory cake. Oh. For little Laurels. Oh. <laughs> I don't know if this is going to feed everyone here, but I'm going to start to cut it. So, um, happy birthday, New School. <laughs> it's worth it. It's good. There is also more cake for everyone downstairs. Yes. Yes. yes, there is Bobka downstairs donated by our friends at Breads to say happy birthday to us. And I think that Gnarls also has some birthday gifts for the new school for people in the audience. What's that in your pouch? Yes, Gnarls. Yes, Gnarls. So while Gnarls offers some t-shirts, just a quick shout out to Agent of Change, our amazing production company who's helping to run all of the events this week. And I want to let you guys know that there's still a ton of open events on the schedule. Got some feedback that a lot were closed. I know that they were, um, those were very popular, but we still have a ton of open events. Oh, nice, David. <laughs> all right. Later today, you can learn some tricks for your memory on this stage with Jim Quick. We also have Dustin Yellen of Pioneer Works, who is doing an artist talk in Woolman Hall at 6 o'clock. And then tonight at 7.30, we have Tarana Burke here. The whole week is jam-packed with programming, so be sure to look online. There's an app you can download to view everything. And just let us know if you have any questions. Thank you, and happy birthday. Happy birthday, New School. Happy birthday. I will reiterate, there is cake downstairs. Don't leave There's babka cake. downstairs. What? <laughs> There's not? There's babka. Uh, a babka. Uh, chocolate, chocolate and apple yes. honey babka. Babka. The bee bug. I said there's not. I'm like, disregard. <laughs>